this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze, the podcast. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Winelect, and today we're going to be looking at how Microsoft became more open to open source. But first, I wanted to take a look at just one new feature on Azure because it's been a pretty quiet week as far as announcements goes in the Azure space. This announcement came from the principal manager over the Azure Maps program and they have launched a bunch of new features for the maps sdk including uh, some enhancements on the spatial io module where you can have a lot of different formats for reading input data into the maps uh, apis and dealing with those such as geo rss geo json are a few that i'm familiar with when i've worked with uh, different mapping applications they have some uh, additions to uh, pop-up templates where you can have uh, pinpoints on a map and you can click on that and ex expand that and that template will give you some expanded information about what that dot represents on a particular map and uh, this is a powerful feature for overlaying things on top of the maps in the maps SDK they also have additional uh, things related to web SDK uh, anchors and other things like that that are stylable more so than what they had before. And all this comes together with a whole bunch of code samples and galleries for that that you can go out there and look at those available from Azure Maps. But on to our main story today. So for our main segment today, we're going to be looking at how Microsoft became more open to open source and how Windows became friends with Linux when they used to be more or less opposed to one another. Now, this story can really find its roots all the way back in the 1970s with the start of Microsoft as a company. Microsoft in the mid 70s started by making basic interpreters for a number of platforms that were available in various computing spheres at that time. Now, one of those platforms was the Altair uh, machine put out by NITS computers and Bill Gates and Paul Allen and some developers wrote a basic interpreter for that platform. Now at that time, uh, the Altair was very primitive. It didn't really do much, but it was really considered to be probably the first PC uh, that really started the PC industry and most uh, experts would point to that PC as being the first one available and it became widely used among hobbyists at the time who were buying it more for the hardware than they were uh, buying it for the software because really the idea of software wasn't exactly uh, solidified in the minds of many people at that time. Software was largely seen as an extension of the hardware platform. It was implicit because, oh, hey, I bought the, the hardware, therefore whatever software it runs, I should be entitled to that as well. Well, Bill Gates had a completely different vision for software. He really saw software as a thing in and of itself, and it wasn't so much an extension of hardware, but it was something that could be bought and sold in the same way that hardware was sold. And so you could develop software to run on hardware and that software could be bought and sold and licensed in much the same way that hardware was at the time. And he really focused more on writing software for multiple platforms rather than trying to develop a program to run on a specific kind of computer. And to that end, that's where the software industry kind of got its roots. Now, Bill Gates, in response to that in the 70s, he wrote a letter that's widely been published and it was entitled an open letter to a hobbyist and he writes and i quote hardware most people pay for for software it is, it is something to share who cares if people who work for it get paid is this fair one thing that you don't do by stealing software is get back at MITS for the some problem that you have had with it. MITS doesn't make any money selling software. The royalties paid to us, the manuals, the tapes, and the overhead, it goes into break-even operation. One thing that you do prevent is good software from being written. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three man years into programming, finding all the bugs, documenting his product, and then distributing it for free? So right off the bat, we see some 
tension between the hardware industry and the, the software that was running there where you had some folks that were wanting free software and you were wanting some people that were making money off of software at the same time. And so you have commercial interest in software going all the way back to these early days of computing. It was during this period of the mid 70s and late 70s and even into the early 80s that the software industry really got birth and Microsoft got some legs under it and they started making their basic interpreter for a number of platforms, uh, including platforms like Apple and IBM PCs that were running Microsoft software. And Microsoft really focused in on making software, not so much hardware and licensing software, but the ideology that Microsoft was expressing, as we saw in the open letter to hobbyists, really is the driver behind the commercial software uh, industry. And the ideology of free software was still very much in the minds of many people who wanted to have available to many uh, people as they could free software. Now, the ideological differences basically came down to the difference between a proprietary model of software distribution where the source code was unavailable and software was distributed in a binary form that ran on computers and the opposite of that where source code was made available and those who wanted to use that source code could build it themselves and run it on their computers if they so chose to. And these ideological differences were what birthed the free software movement that we see in the 1980s and it was primarily championed by a man named Richard Stallman. And Richard Stallman started the GNU project, which became the umbrella project under which Linux would later be developed in 1983. And then he started the Free Software Foundation in 1985 to promote these ideological views of how software uh, should be written and released. Now, the free software movement in the 1980s was a fairly academic thing, and it wasn't something that was in the mainstream minds. However, it wasn't down and out by any stretch of the imagination. But where it really started to take off is in the next decade, in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we see uh, the rise of Linux, and, and it is during this time where Linus Torvalds has a conflict with one of his professors who wrote the operating system Minix. Now, Minix is an educational operating system that was developed for educational purposes only, not for commercial interest. L Linus Torvalds wanted a general purpose operating system, and he asked if he could use Minix for that, but the licensing of Minix prevented that, so Linus Torvalds went out uh, and wrote his own Unix compatible uh, operating system that would run on a x86 PC at the time and that's how Linux got started and Linus Torvalds as he wrote it released it under the GNU project and it became known as GNU Linux and he wanted it to be a general purpose operating system that anybody could run for whatever they wanted to but it be available uh, with the source code that anybody can modify study and use and as long as they contributed back to the project and kept the source code available for any changes they made they were uh, able to use it and they were under the licensing that agreements that they had with the GNU project. So throughout the 90s, the Linux movement, if you want to call it that, really got going. It started to gain some traction during the late 90s, uh, and a few distros were birthed, particularly the Debian distro, and the ability to install it on um, pretty much any available hardware became a reality at that time as well. And it became a viable operating system and a really viable alternative to those who really wanted to to run something other than a Windows based or DOS based PC, which is really the only game in town during the 90s and into the early 2000s. If you didn't want to run a Macintosh, of course, but if you wanted to run an x86 PC, it was pretty much going to be running a Windows operating system or a DOS based operating system. In the next decade, in the 2000s, Linux became economically viable because it matured enough and also as the result of some other movements within the context of free software. Some programming languages like PHP really began to catch on and PHP could run on Windows but it was cross-platform so it could run on Linux as well and the PHP language and others like it became the 
principal development languages for developing web apps. And the web apps that were running on this were things like PHP Nuke and things for running personal websites. And so these personal websites were being hosted on Linux based uh, servers. And so the idea of running a web server on Linux didn't require that somebody have any need for Windows to run these PHP apps. And so Linux as a server operating system really started to take off during this time. And we, there was a number of companies that really saw the economic viability of Linux and they started to develop a commercially available version of Linux, particularly companies like Red Hat, uh, who championed Red Hat uh, Linux. And then that later became uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And then the more or less open source, completely open source version of that CentOS is what we have today as a result of that. And then a number of other uh, platforms that were available on top of Linux. So we had the LAMP stack as it's become known. There was Linux as the operating system, Apache as the, uh, the web server. It ran uh, MySQL as a database. And then you had either PHP, Python, or Perl for the programming language. And the LAMP stack was complemented by applications like cPanel and other types of management tools that really birthed a whole ecosystem for managing applications on Linux servers that served up websites of all different kinds. And these became a popular sell for many people who just wanted a easy to run website without having to run Windows servers and pay the licensing costs and all that associated with running Windows servers. Another development in the Linux space that really kicked Linux into overdrive was Android. In 2007, we saw the release of the original iPhone and it ran the proprietary operating system from Apple, but right on its heels, we saw a number of manufacturers release handsets that ran Android, which was a Linux based phone operating system with its own uh, ecosystem that emerged around it. That's still going strong today. In fact, it's running over 80% of the world's smartphones uh, as of the recording of this video. While Android didn't make a huge impact in the Linux space per se, Android did change how we perceive operating system. Up to this point, we had perceived an operating system as something you bought from a proprietary vendor like Apple or Microsoft. And when upgrades came out, you would pay for those upgrades like you would for any piece of software. But with Android, it being a free operating system that ran on a phone, the upgrades to it weren't something that were the users were paying for. Rather, they were something that the vendors were giving out for free. So if I bought a handset and it had one version of Android on it, when a new one was released, it was likely that I'd get at least two or three versions of that new operating system, even though I wasn't paying for the operating system. So this model caught on and we saw during that same period of time, Apple adopted a very similar approach for iOS and for Mac OS on the Macintosh and Windows later followed suit more or less when it started giving free upgrades from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to Windows 10 as well as providing continual updates for Windows 10 for free as the Windows 10 operating system has matured in the desktop space. What changed Microsoft though, wasn't so much the impact of Linux as much as it was a change in leadership at Microsoft. But what changed at Microsoft wasn't so much the impact of Linux as it was a change in leadership. In the Gates and Balmer era at Microsoft, open source was something that was considered antithetical to the business model of Microsoft. However, in 2014, Satya Nadella became CEO of Microsoft and this change of leadership changed Microsoft's attitude towards open source. And they did a 180 degree turn in their attitude towards open source. So under Satya Nadella, there's been a lot of changes that have been made that made Microsoft certainly more open source friendly. One, they in incorporated the Windows subsystem for Linux in 2016 with version one, and now they're on version two. And this allowed Linux to operate right alongside Windows and allowed Linux apps to run within the context of a Windows uh, desktop or a Windows server. 
In 2018, Microsoft bought GitHub, which is the world's largest repository for open source project. In 2019, Microsoft switched from their proprietary browser-based engine to the open source project Chromium, which underscores Microsoft's own browser, Edge now. It also underscores Safari, Chrome, and Firefox, and most of the other popular browsers available today. Under Nadella as well, Microsoft has pivoted to the cloud and has really gotten out of the business of selling software licensing as much as they are selling software as a service and selling value-added services for software. And they are seeing a lot of open source and a lot of Linux usage in the cloud because of that. And Microsoft now has two thirds of the VMs on Azure running Linux. And this is a marked difference from when Azure first launched when it was principally mostly Windows VMs. And even so, Microsoft continues to grow its presence with many more of its VMs running Linux in different contexts on Azure. So what does all this teach us about open source software and commercial interest in software? It was interesting to see the history of how they diverged in the late 70s and 80s on two different paths and how they've almost come full circle nowadays. They both got some things right and they both got some things wrong, but what we've seen in the last decade or so is how they have been able to create a nice synergy for one another. I think it's safe to say that some of the most successful open source software projects that are out there are due to the fact that they had significant investment from those who had commercial interest in software. Now, that isn't to say that all of the open source projects out there are successful because of that, but many of them are. If we, we look at even Linux itself, we can see how the commercial interest in Linux has really done a good job of creating an operating system that is free for whoever wants to download and use it. But at the same time, the commercial interest in that has really helped ramp it up to make it a very economical and very viable platform because of the investments made by commercial interest in that software. But at the same time, what open source has really done has created de facto open standards that prevent vendor lock-in, which was the main complaint against the proprietary software in the early uh, 80s and the late 70s. And because of what was implied by selling software whenever you bought it from a single vendor. So these two different aspects of the software industry where you have investment coming in from commercial interest, but you have these de facto open standards becoming out of open source has really created a nice synergy where no one owns a particular stack, but you end up with a stack that can be used by anybody in any particular platform. So think about something like Docker, for instance, it's an open platform that has been capitalized on by companies like Microsoft, Google, and, and Amazon that have entire ecosystems built around that, yet none of those companies control the particular stack itself. So it's become a very viable place to run applications, but at the same time, we see a lot of value added by going with one of those cloud partners, such as Microsoft with Azure Kubernetes Services or something like that. Secondly, the commercial interest has also provided a value added service to the open source movement as well. So open source as it is, is the vehicle to run applications, but you need somewhere to run that application whenever you have it deployed onto an operating system. And that's where the platform as a service offerings from places like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google all come in with their platform as a service offerings for running virtual machines, which can run Windows or Linux in those virtual machines. And by running platform as a service, they add value to the operating system and they provide the tools to scale that and to provide redundancy and resiliency and availability to those virtual machines as they are running in the cloud. So the takeaway is not that so the takeaway is not to view commercial interest in open source as a threat to open source software, nor is it to view open source software as something that shouldn't have commercial interest in it either, but rather to view them as something that can be synergistic and work together to create better software for everybody that is using it.
So thanks for tuning into this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze, the podcast. I hope to see you on a future episode and thanks for listening. Thank you.